great to be here. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, we heard some really great presentations today, and I, I love them so much because they're honest and true, and uh, it doesn't happen that often. Uh, so, my topic today is uh, preventive measures, I believe, yes? Yeah. I am Charles Watkins. Hello, I'm a clinical psychologist and a psychotherapist, uh, and I specialize in the maritime sector, maritime psychology, which didn't really exist before we started doing extensive work in the area. Uh, okay, so for those who don't know us, who are we? We have around 60 psychologists around the world uh, in all different uh, countries and in all types of languages, and we cover commercial ships, cruise liners, and super yachts. Uh, we have different services in place. We do the 24-7 helpline, which is mainly a, a crisis support helpline or a helpline where seafarers can confidentially reach out to us and access mental health support and help. Mm. We also do on-site support. So when things go really bad and seafarers <coughs> request us to come, they're having difficulty adjusting to what happened. Usually it's very severe accidents, piracy murder. <coughs> we then go and we normalize and we offer support and we try to educate the people there to support each other. Mm -hmm. And then we also do training and seminars. Okay, let's get into it. These are some of our clients that we work for. Uh, let's get to the interesting part. Mm. I think it's very difficult to to bring transparency into a industry that doesn't like transparency. Um, I just got off the phone with a very good friend of mine, a professor at the World Maritime University. Uh, I teach a summer course there on mental health as well. And they're about to release a new report to the ITF, uh, actually beginning October now, about the widely extensive practice of falsifying work records and rest hours. Um, that's a topic for another day, but I just wanted to mention it because if you don't have enough people on the vessel, uh, you don't get enough rest, you get enough sleep, you're going to have mental health problems. I chose, I chose these, uh, these couple topics for today because I think they are relevant and I don't think they're discussed the way I want to discuss them. The first one is social media. So why is it so important? Uh, I will give you a quick view into my own life. About 10 years ago I was invited to work on a project. I helped develop um, procedures that would help people that had major surgeries recover more quickly by looking at psychological and environmental factors. And while I was working there, I also met other, I guess, colleagues of mine that were working on other things like Google Mail and Facebook and the like. Mm. While I was discussing these social media things with them, I realized that these systems were designed to make you addictive, to create addiction, to make you come back to it again and again, to learn your patterns, and then to ultimately <coughs> make you use it even more. And today, still in contact with them, uh, none of their friends, none of their family members, none of their kids use these social media apps. Um, and that's saying something. So let's have a look at uh, some of the usage. This is some of the highest numbers I've found, to be honest. Uh, it's a very recent study. Mm. As you can see, the average time spent on social media is extremely high, almost six hours, if we look at the ages 16 to 34. And if we look at the types of media platforms used, you can see Facebook's pretty high up there, YouTube, WhatsApp as well, form of social media, yeah. Instagram, and I guess I don't even know all the others, to be honest, but uh, <laughs> there are many, as you can see. Uh, 
So what's going on with social media? And uh, we talk about connectedness on board. Yeah, that's great. And we talk about seafarers spending you know, more time in their cabins. What is actually happening? Why are they doing this? And what exactly is going on with them when they do that? Okay. So it is designed to, in, in general, social media is designed to represent an unrealistic, perfect picture of everyone, okay? Something it's, that's just unattainable for anyone. Uh, we look at big things that happen in our lives and they get posted and we look at the rewards that go with them. We look at different types of pictures and videos that are clearly not the way life works. Mm -hmm. and, and there's one thing I want to normalize. Today and I and if you, if you take nothing with you today, I want you to take this with you. All feelings are valid. I do read a lot nowadays along the lines of only good vibes, only good energy, only good emotions, only smiles. Uh, all feelings need and want to be felt. They're part of our human experience. Joy, laughter, sadness, grief is part of it. It makes us who we are. And I'm very happy about the, the presentations before him because they confirmed, and as you could tell by the way they were talking about them, the body, the brain, the soul needs to go through these things. That's how we develop. It's part of our character. It's part of our psychological well-being. It's part of our resilience. Mm. And one of the major issues about psychological illnesses and mental health is that you do not recognize it clearly enough. If someone is sick, has a fever, if someone has a cut, if someone is clearly injured, you can separate the personality from the person very clearly. With mental health, that's very, very difficult. The, the line, the threshold between their personality and the sickness, it kind of merges. So they might not be responding to you. They might not be as joyful. They might not be calling you. They might, not, they might seem not to care about you anymore. Uh, it's very difficult to draw that line when it comes to mental health illnesses. And that is one of the big challenges. Like on vessels, if someone cuts themselves, they're going to say, you're dripping blood everywhere. What, what the hell are you doing? Wrap that up. Get that cleaned. Yeah? But if someone is depressed and down, makes mistakes, is fatigued, they're not likely to respond that way. They're going to say, get your act together. What's wrong with you? Huh? And that's a very different message. The first message is caring and responding towards someone. The other one is, what's wrong with you? Yeah? If that's the first message you're getting, of course you're going to develop a negative picture and, a, and create the combination of weakness and mental health. Okay? And this social media is definitely not helping. It's contributing to the problem. It's showing you things that are not real. Uh, and this ultimately leads to anxiety, depression. It leads to isolation. It can lead to self-doubt, uh, eating disorders. Unfortunately, uh, these don't come with warning signs. Uh, it took a lot of years until cigarettes came with warning signs, finally. This is going to take a long time, if at all, if they come with, this should come with warning signs. This is very dangerous. And I want you to take that with you today, that understanding um, for yourself, for your family, for seafarers, for your company. This is not, don't take this lightly. This is very dangerous. This has been designed by very smart people, very smart psychologists who know exactly how to get you using more of it and make you nervous when you read messages. Um, the need to connect, the need to belong, is something that is being done all the time, but it doesn't fulfill the need. It doesn't help you, it doesn't, <coughs> it doesn't grow your resilience. The way you grow your resilience is by face-to-face -face contact. The most important people are the people who are around you, proximity, the people you are spending time with, you know? your colleagues, your superiors. Um, 
and I do want you to remember that, it is that need can develop quickly into an addiction. Um, and the younger people are, the, of course, the more they are vulnerable for this. Yeah? Um, not too long ago, we were, we were flown out to the, doesn't matter, to one of the vessels and uh, there was a, a big fire and um, people were very worried and they were struggling with some of the, um, <coughs> they're struggling to adjust to, um, um, and to continue work. And the interesting thing about this, this mission, I guess, was they did not rate the traumatic experience of the fire as the worst thing. They said the worst thing was we couldn't reach our families, they couldn't reach us. They didn't know what was going on. We're living in a world where connection and immediate response is very normal. Yeah? Being able to reach people is very normal. So not being able to reach a person for 24 hours or longer creates an ex anxiety, an ex worry on both sides. So as you can see, uh, and I was very surprised, but my whole team was surprised to, to learn about this, but the connection they have with the people they care about, with their loved ones, is, is so important that it can cause extreme distress if this is capped um, and if there's no information you know, about, about their whereabouts or how they're doing. And as you can see here, the Canadian Association of Mental Health, um, they looked at students who just spend two hours a day uh, on social media and they reported higher rates of anxiety, depression, and uh, a suicide ideation. That's huge, it's just two hours. Mm. And the new generation is growing up with this. The new generation of seafarers are going to use these things more and more, okay? So um, there has to be something in place that educates, not them, but everyone in the world about this, about the overuse, about abuse, about responsible scrolling, about how you choose your content, what, what you're actually looking at, what it's doing to you. you know? Because uh, remember in the very beginning, cigarettes were prescribed as anxiety medication. You know? I mean, you've come a long way, thank God, but this is the exact same thing. It's, 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 it's dangerous. Uh, it has to be used responsibly. It's a great tool, don't get me wrong, I'm, I don't want to paint um, a just black picture about it, but uh, there is a reason they're doing this, and once you're educated about these things, you are able to make better educated choices mm -hmm. about the way you use this stuff. Okay, So that's just one big thing I just wanted to let you guys know. Um, It's not, it's not necessarily a conscious choice to do this. Yeah? There are a lot of systems in place that make sure that you feel guilt and shame, pride and joy when you do certain things online. Okay? All right. Uh, the second one is uh, safety procedures in the mental health uh, area. So. Mm. When we started out, none of the companies really had these things in place. We had to write them ourselves, we had to go through the different protocols, look at safety features and look at how we can, how we can describe these things as checklists or as lists they can look up. Everything in the industry has a checklist. People love checklists. Um, but for this, they're like, oh, let's just wing it. Let's just see what happens if we do this and this. That should not be the case. This should be standardized. There should be proper systems in place that look over this. There should be a group of people you know, discussing these things and, and saying, okay, this needs to stay, this needs to go. Um, but if we normalize these systems, then we normalize the occurrence of mental health issues. Yeah? And we can, we can then help them... Uh, quicker, faster, and, and normalize even the top four to say, hey, ah, okay, I recognize this. There's a checklist for us. Let's see, let's see what we can do to keep you safe, okay? Mm. This is an example of an of a escalation procedure for mental health. So someone is suffering from uh, suicide ideation, doesn't feel safe, doesn't know what to do, has, has, has talked about it, maybe has done some self-harm. What do you do? Of course, you need to contact professionals, but you also have a checklist to say, what do I do first? Okay, so 
There has to be eyes on this person. You have to look at, you know, interventions that are possible right now. Maybe the person is suffering, needs medication, yeah? Talk to the, uh, talk to the radio medical advice or telemedicine, however you want to call it. Let's get this, pay, this person something they can relax with. Maybe they need to sleep. Uh, safety room planning. Let's get all the dangerous items out of the room, yeah, if they don't feel safe. Uh, restraint protocol is usually not necessary, that's extreme. Uh, family support. One of the biggest helps is family support in these situations. People forget about water intake all the time. People in this type of uh, situation, they're not thinking about eating or drinking. You can go a couple days or longer without eating, but water is crucial. You don't want symptoms of hydration if you're dealing with someone that's an extreme risk of hurting themselves. Cultural psychology issues. You want to look at culture. I'll get into that later. Um, and of course, stress sources. Can we eliminate some of them? This is just a very small list of a simple procedure for escalation when people don't feel safe um, that seafarers can have at their disposal and they can use, and they can feel more confident about mental health. Mental health is scary to people who don't understand it, but there are simple practical ways we need to deploy in order to help you feel more confident about these things. Huh? Um, which brings me to, and I'm so happy that, you know, uh, my predecessor talked about this. It's about leadership as well. It's about the culture on board that is lived. If you don't feel safe, then you are not going to be able to speak up about these things. If you don't have leadership or from the company side that supports all this, it's not going to work. You need systemic change. Mm. All resilience on board is defined by how leadership lives principles and philosophy when it comes to safety and mental health. We see this all the time. So if this isn't there, uh, it's not going to work. Um, so there is a, a beautiful style called compassionate leadership and has nothing to do with weakness and everything to do with strength. It appreciates people, it sees people who they are, they value what they can do, they try to promote them and see what, what needs to be improved, how they can improve. It doesn't ridicule, it doesn't humiliate people. We've had so many cases of bullying and harassment that have uh, ended horribly because this is a real issue on board. Um, and there's a huge difference between authority and leaders. So people might follow your rules because you have authority. That does not mean you are a leader. It doesn't mean they look up to you. It doesn't mean they trust you. It doesn't mean they trust you with sensitive personal things. It doesn't mean they think they can come to you for help. That makes all the difference in the world. Um, and there are countless studies to, to show this is the case. Mm. Yeah, I'll stop there. <coughs> And when we look at things that are preventable, things that we can teach and train and look at, we need to include shore-based staff. It just makes sense. It, they're part of the entire operation. So the first, a lot of times when things get noticed, it's them contacting us or saying, hey, I'm worried about this guy or this person. Uh, and they're under a lot of stress as well. And if seafarers don't trust, them or the company, then you also don't have people who are open to speak up about these things. So they just, the, the superintendents, they deserve this type of support as well. Because first of all, not just for them, but also as a consult, so they can just speak things through and say, hey, I'm worried about this guy, can we do something? And to support them as well. They were under extreme stress. We we did a lot of trainings for them uh, during during COVID and, and because companies were saying they're getting sick, they're quitting, we don't know what's happening. We did workshops with them. Um, and to be honest, you don't have to be a clinician to do these workshops. It just shows them that you value their input, you gather the data, and then you can change something about the, the work environment that might be toxic in nature. Right? How much time do I have left? Sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, Starting. Okay. So, okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm good in time. I'll leave some room for questions later. Um, and uh, I guess last but not least is 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 cultural psychology. Mm, that's a tricky one. Uh, 
my team and I have learned so much about cultural psychology in the last couple of years from our psychologists around the world. Mm. I think here the most important thing to understand and to know is that it doesn't matter where you got your training, your clinical training, it doesn't matter what books you think are great or diagnostic tools you use. If that person in front of you is from a small village or a country or something that you are not aware of and, you're, and you don't know about, then you need to have that perspective. There are so many cases we would have diagnosed as psychotic episodes, hallucinations, um, or other, which are just very normal ways that people deal with things. Huh? The body responds, uh, the brain responds, and then they go through things. Um, that's one reason why it's very normal to have these priests come on board and do a ceremony. Yeah? The holy water, the praying in groups together, and maybe the individual praying, is hugely important to reduce anxiety. Yeah? It's hugely important to understand that that's a real thing. They're suffering from hearing the voices, seeing maybe things that, that, that aren't there, but this is part of their belief structure. Yeah? By understanding these parameters, you can actually help things before they get worse. Now, you can contain things. Mm, we've done a lot of work with, with people that were seeing ghosts, that believed in spirits, that were afraid of spirits. We've used herbs, we've used salts of all kinds um, to, to help against ghosts and other things. So if it works, then why not use it? Yeah. And for that, you need the perspective of people of that country to understand what that person is going through. Mm. It kind of defines how we look at problems. Yeah. Yeah. So, all in all is that one of the most important things is normalizing this subject and understanding that the entire social media bubble is not helping. It is creating a world that is extremely dangerous and it might even hurt people. No? We have to understand how these things work together, why they're doing what they're doing to us, so we can stop them. Um, yeah, so thank you very much uh, for listening. We're gonna open the floor up for questions now. Um, some of our contact details here, and again, thank you for having me. <laughs>